Hi everyone, I'm Jess Hathaway, Editor-in-Chief of National Fishermen, and today I have with me Bob Dooley, who is a lifelong commercial fisherman from Half Moon Bay, California, who helped found the Seafood Harvesters of America, as well as United Catcher Boats, an advocacy organization that helped to unify the voices of Alaska's groundfish trawl fleet. Bob Dooley serves on the Pacific Fishery Management Council and was also named a National Fisherman Highliner in 2017. Welcome, Bob. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Jess. Good, great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I just want to start today with uh, where are you calling us from today? Well, I'm at home, as I'm sure everyone else is too <laughs> these days, um, in Half Moon Bay, California. That's where I've lived my entire life. Great. Well, I'm glad you could be here with us. So I want to start today talking about safety. Speaking of California, you worked with Mike Conroy of the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations to compile a checklist and some references for captains and owners to run their own checks on boats that have been tied up waiting for an opening. And I know that you geared that toward the Dungeness fleet on the West Coast. Can you talk to us about what inspired that list? Well, you know, having lived here all my life and seeing fishermen leave and not come back in, you know, particularly the crab fishery, it's, it's dangerous, it's bad time of year. And we, we had some delays in the season due to whale entanglement in the Dungeness crab fishery. And then we had some uh, domoic acid issues on the North Coast and <clears throat> various reasons why the season was delayed but everybody was ready to go when the season was supposed to open. So boats, you know, I noticed going down to the dock that boats as, a, as usual were loaded, you know, and overloaded with, with crab gear and sitting at the dock for, you know, a month at a time and, <clears throat> and not, you know, not being able to get below decks and see what's going on, a lot of them, not all, but a lot. So my concern was, as it always is, is that, you know, people, pay attention to that and maybe it would be a good reminder because in the in the heat of the business trying to get a price trying to feed your family trying to sitting at the dock going through the holidays with no income the you know the last thing on the checklist a lot of times is you know the, the safety so you know <clears throat> i had earlier a number of years earlier i had been involved with safety with you know the north pacific fleets and Leslie Hughes with um, NPF VOA. And, you know, seen a lot of friends there too that didn't come home and rescued a few out of the water myself and things like that and people that we didn't get back. And so I, I you know, I, I have a sensitivity to that. When I stopped fishing a number of years ago and, you know, retired from active fishing, I started seeing this, um, alternative safety compliance coming in for vessels. And, you know, a majority of my career was on larger vessels that are in, in Alaska and the West Coast. And, you know, so I knew safety from that perspective and I knew what was going on with alternative safety compliance and understood that with Chris Woodley because Chris and I are good friends, been through the safety functions and such. And so I knew that this alternative safety compliance did not fit our fleet. In, in California. It didn't fit the small boat fishermen. It didn't fit the one man boat. I mean, uh, you, how many drills, oh, man overboard drills can you do with one person? So it, it took a different skill set and a different set than just making regulations. So we called a town hall meeting in California because there was none. There were, and we went from North Coast all the way to S San Diego, you know, to and brought people together in Half Moon Bay with Coast Guard representatives, Chris Kane, Chris Woodley, came down and people the uh, people from Seattle came down and, and we talked about this. And I think we had over a thousand years of history in the, in the fisheries in the room, guys that have fished by themselves or one or man, two man crew for their entire lives. And said, you can't, you know, this isn't gonna work for us. So I think we were successful in getting the voluntary safety approach and, you know, and getting to uh, voluntary safety uh, best practices. So flash forward, Mike Conroy actually came from Southern California to that meeting in Half Moon Bay. And I work with Mike with his, his work in, uh, uh, in, in, um, in PP, PPCA, you know, PF, P, 
PCA, what it, the Pacific Coast Fisherman's yeah, Society. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Too many acronyms. Yeah, <laughs> I just want to <laughs> also go back and just note that MPFVOA is North Pacific Fishing, Fishing Vessel Owners Association too, for right. anyone who doesn't know. So anyhow, long story short, which is kind of too late for that, I guess now, <laughs> so, we, you know, we got together, Mike and I said, you know, we ought to put out a, just a statement, just a, a, a checklist to get together just and just distribute it, uh, you know, to our own organizations and to fleets and people we know and try to raise the bar, raise the, the consciousness of this, just like get people to start the conversation. Mike thought it was a good idea. Mike did most of the writing. We did the edit it together and put this together. And of course, it's right in the middle of the holidays. Everybody was gone, including you. Including me, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, uh, we, we kind of grassroots got this distributed, got a lot of feedback that it was a great, you know, that it was a, a good message, particularly from wives and sisters and, and the, of fishermen that said, you know, really good because they, you know, they feel it more than any. And you're in the middle of the holidays. So um, that's, that's how it was. That's how, that's how it all came together. And I, I think it was, I think it's a good message. And I think the message is more than just crab season. That's what was the, was the impetus for doing it because it was co coastwide from, you know, from the North coast all the way, you know, from S Seattle all the way down. It was, that was a, a common, uh, a common issue with Dungeness crab. There were delays. So uh, spread it as wide as we could, but obviously thought about it later and said, this isn't a bad idea. This is a, this is a message that is, is applicable to everyone. So that's, that's the short of that. Yeah, it's a great message. I have to say, um, I want to note that this, it, this piece will be published in National Fisherman's upcoming issue, and it's also going to be available online. We're going to make it available online in full. So when that is available online, we're going to post the link here on this page. So for anyone who's watching this on the National Fisherman site, you can find that link, you know, below the video on this page. Um, and I just want to emphasize that th it's a different take on safety checks. Yes, it's sort of the, doing your own dockside safety exam, but it's the, in, the emphasis is, you know, you've been tied up, you've checked all these things before you're ready to go. But now, as you've noted, you've been sitting at the dock with all your gear on deck waiting to go. And what does that mean for all of those things that you checked before you know, a month has gone by while you were tied up at the dock, you know, have things been moved around as people have been on and off the boat. And that, that is a new take on a safety check. And I think it is really important to note that, you know, even though you're tied up at the dock, not everything on board is static in that time period. So I just want to note that that piece will be available to anyone who's interested in reading it. And I think it is an important read and not just for the West Coast fleet, as you noted in the piece, it, it applies to people in, in ports everywhere. So um, one, of the, one, of the, uh, one of the issues here has been, you know, the leading cause of fatalities on boats, commercial fishing boats, has been man overboard, getting people, you know, that, that's been the, the prime, the prime uh, emphasis. Uh, as a result of our town halls in Half Moon Bay and the safety and kind of re-engaging after I retired, um, I applied for the um, I applied for the Coast Guard Commercial Fishing Safety Advisory Committee and was accepted. And I've been a member of that for a couple of years now. And now it's going to transition to another name, but it right. I'm up for appointment for that as well. So I'm, um, you know, that got me. The reason I did that was because I really did see that the small boat guys, the guys, you know, the, the, particularly the fleets in California were under, they weren't represented in this, this conversation nationally and weren't driving any of the conversation. They were recipients of, of the, of the directions, not, not part of the team. And so I hope I'm a, a voice in that. I know there are a lot of small boat guys from the East coast and such that are on the committee. But I think the West Coast has a, a, a particular interest in this as well. And I think, you know, we it really the I guess the take home message from this meeting was that safety is is really between the ears. You know, you, you need to you need to be prepared, but if you don't drill, if you don't keep it on the front burner, if you don't 
talk about it and be prepared. I mean, I always use the analogy of the earthquake in California that we, you know, I, in 1989, when the big earthquake during the World Series hit here, you know, I was at home cooking dinner for my kids who were at swim lessons and my wife and everybody was coming over and the house started shaking and I was eight feet from the back door. And, you know, I could have just walked out in the backyard and unless the sun fell out of the sky, I was not going to get hurt. And however, what did I do? I went under a doorway and hung on because that's what I learned in grammar school. <laughs> you know, that's what you drill. That's what you, that's what comes to you. So um, I know I, I almost when it quit shaking, I go, what am I doing in here? And, 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 you know, but however, drilling familiarity works. Yeah. And there's not time to look at your notes. No, <laughs> that's right. That's yeah. right. Um, okay. So uh, can you talk, I don't know if you've gotten any feedback on this. I know you, you said that you have gotten a little bit of feedback since the holidays have passed and, and people weren't um, sort of out of commission, but um, have you gotten other feedback on it, on it from people in the fleets? You know, up and right down now? the coast, yeah, the people that we distributed it to, they, that you know, they they were appreciative, and it wasn't it wasn't taken in the context of, uh, you know, somebody telling you to to do something. It was it was taken in the context it was delivered. It was, you know, pay attention. Don't don't forget this. In the rush to get out of town, don't forget this. And a, a, you know, from uh, Westport to San Diego, I got good comments from that. And even though there's not much crab fishing going on in San Diego, um, they they still, the message was was appropriate. So I'm, I'm glad that it's gonna be in, in your, in the magazine because I think it is an appropriate message nationwide. It just, it's about preparedness and particularly with stand downs and, and, and the, the stress. I mean, right now we have, um, some issues going on in Dutch Harbor with uh, COVID and plants shut down for extended times and people at the dock ready to go. And, you know, um, it's, it's that last check before you leave the dock. A lot of times it really counts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Bob. So I want to talk about as other aspects of your industry advocacy here, but first I want to hear about your your love of fishing because that is what this <laughs> came from, your love of fishing and, and your fellow fishermen. Can you talk about how you came into commercial fishing? Oh, I, I certainly can. Um, my family was in, in fishing locally here in, in, in Half Moon Bay for years. They didn't start as fishermen. Um, they... They started as, you know, working in, in, in farms and dairies and doing that type of thing on the coast because we're kind of an agricultural area as well. And they started there. My mother left the house at like 18 years old. And this is, you know, this is back in the 30s and uh, did something that most women probably didn't or wouldn't do. She rented a house and took three men in with her to, uh, to help pay the rent. So she lived there, you know, and I, I could just imagine, but that was my mom. Mm -hmm. So she had a seafood restaurant. She worked in a seafood restaurant. Uh, she left the ranch, went to work for a guy who owned a hotel and restaurant. And he um, let her take over this business on the, on the harbor to start a restaurant. So we grew up in that. We, you know, it wasn't Friday night, I get to go to the show or anything like that. It was go wash dishes and you know, even when I, I mean, I I look now at the social security thing that they give you every year to tell you how many, you know, how much you've paid in. I was born in 53. I started paying social security, you know, uh, withholding in 1963, 10 years old, because we were working for an hourly wage for my mom. And I worked at the end of the dock for my, my uncle was a fish buyer. He also ran charter boats. My dad ran charter boats and owned boats. Um, all of that was just ingrained. I mean, we brought the boats home in our front yard and, and worked on them, you know, uh, they would, uh, and, and so everything about me was all things fish. And, you know, I ran the crab stand for a while and all of that. And when I was 11, uh, a friend of mine uh, broke his back in an auto accident. 
and he had a little um, Monterey Clipper troller. I think it was probably less than 30 feet, but that was his living and he needed a deck in. And so he talked my mom into letting me go for the summer. How and old were you then? 11. Mm -hmm. And so I, but providing we didn't go above Bodega Bay, because nothing happened good above Bodega Bay, according to my mom. So, you know, for the, dealing with fishermen all our life. So we spent the summer fishing and I, that, you know, I earned, earned what I thought was huge money. And uh, it was, you know, I was hooked. I mean, I was hooked from day one, just being part of all of it. And so um, that's kind of, that's kind of where we grew up. I, we grew up also, you know, understanding you got to work all the time. We did, that's all, my mom would, would not let that not happen. If you didn't have a job, you were going to be in the dish, dishes. So um, my brother and I started cutting firewood on the side as well and selling that. And all for the reason to build a new boat, to build a boat to a steel boat. And we did that down in a, a lot in the harbor and a 52 foot um, steel um, salmon troller at the time, albacore crab boat. And then it then converted it to a trawler and started bottom trawling when that started being the, you know, the way to make a, make a living as well. And so that just all of those. And then we, we transitioned from that to, buying a couple boats down to when Magnuson came in and we had the vessel obligation guarantees and all of those things floating around and uh, people beating the dock saying, you got to get out there and catch this fish now that it's 200 mile limit and this and that, which we, you know, and being ambitious, no short of ambition here. And uh, so we, we, we got into that and started, we, we bought a boat down in Alabama and brought it around a 75 footer and, and, fished it. My mom also had a strong sense of that said, you know, you don't never put all your, your eggs in one basket. You, uh, that's that she ingrained that. And so we, you know, I actually took a, a hiatus from the fishing part of it and got a join an apprenticeship program in the union for plumbing, went through five years of that, did a, a couple years as a journeyman and, and, and supervisor. And then you know, my brother continued fishing the 75 footer and uh, had sold the 52 footer by then. And then came down the dock one day and said, hey, uh, are you interested in going in partners on a couple boats? And I said, what kind of boats? And he said, 110 foot crab trawlers. And I said, what are we going to do that? You know, that's a, a big step. So in 1979, went to Mississippi and we built a couple trawlers and took them to the Bering Sea, never been there before. Hired some guys to help us along the, to show us the ropes and the rest is kind of history. When we, when got to, we got to Alaska just in time for the crab fishery to fall on its face and us to go bankrupt and all of that and, and struggled our way through with a lot of help and uh, made it work and helped develop the the Pollock fishery and the whiting fishery on the West Coast and brought that from, you know, the Wild West or joint ventures all the way through to the rationalized fisheries we see today and sustainable fisheries. Yeah, that is definitely a wild ride and, and a huge, you saw a huge scope of the history of Alaska fisheries too. Um, so you were, uh, speaking of the Whiting and, and Pollock trawl fleet, you were one of the founding members of United Catcher Boats, which was established in Seattle in the early 90s um, as an advocacy and trade organization for that Bering Sea um, and Gulf of Alaska ground fish trawl fleet. Can you talk a little bit about the foundation of United Catcher Boats and how the work there has evolved? Sure. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, as everything, a, a story that starts way before that. When we first started doing the joint venture work and working, delivering whiting to the Russians and delivering, you know, uh, Pollock and Shelikov Strait to the Koreans and the Japanese and Russians as well, and then out to the Bering Sea and delivering to Russians and Japanese and Polish and you name it. But that was all through joint ventures. And so the, the guy that organized our joint venture, um, a guy named Hugh Riley, Hugh, uh, 
you know, we're, we're young guys. I mean, you know, and, and had no experience in, in this type of fishery. I mean, we're inventing the wheel. Um, you know, we, we successfully did that. We had the right tools, the right boats, all of that, the right fleet, good, great mix of, of, of fishermen, a few, few of which are highliners, which is great. Um, so, you know, we came home after the first winter season and you gave me a call and said, hey, you're not done, you know. I go, what do you mean I'm not done? I said, we've been on the boat for five months and we haven't stopped and I think I'm done. I think I need some time at home. He goes, no, you're not done. He goes, you need to get on a plane and come to Anchorage. We're having a council meeting. I go, what's that about? I have no clue what that was. And he says, well, you know, these regulations that govern your way of life and what you do are being written by people that don't do it. And you need to, you need to participate. You need to, you know, advocate for your, for your right to continue doing what you do and make sure people understand what you do. And so that started it. And so we saw right away that there needed to be an association to bring our fleet together and other fleets. And so I don't remember the name of the first organization, but it was in the, the early 80s, 81, 82, that we started that. And I was a member of that and a founding member of that organization. And there were several different organizations that were just small. So we merged the, a lot of those together and we started American High Seas Fisheries Association. And it was the, to represent the at sea fleet to joint venture pretty much, you know, the ones that the Pollock fisheries uh, in, in Alaska, that's what it was for. And so we started that association. I ended up, uh, it went from, God, I think it, well, it dissolved right when America, when, when United Catcher Boats started because it was a, a, a joining of a bunch of other associations as well. I was president of that association, gosh, for four years, I guess. And it went from 84 to 92, I believe, uh, American High Seas did. And then we saw the need to be a bigger voice, a more united voice. And, you know, at the time, that's when uh, the fishery was Americanized, you know, and, and we were starting the, the inshore offshore talks and all of that stuff, factory trawlers were emerging, all of that. So we started United Catcher Boats with a, a group of people. Steve Hughes was uh, helping us get started. We hired Brent Payne as our executive director right off the bat. And uh, I believe John Groover, and you know John, uh, yeah. Highlander, I think John was our first president, pretty sure. It's been a while now. I mean, so we started we started United Catcher Boats, I think it was 93. Brent's been our, been and has been our executive director. And I continue to say our, because in 2014, I sold, you know, my brother and I sold our boats and basically retired from active fishing and without a boat and without it, uh, no longer eligible to be a member. So I no longer became, was a member of, of UCB, but it's hard, hard not to be uh, still supportive and affiliated and interested in what they do. And I, I, I talk with Brent and John all the time. Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, I want to, so I want to move on from here, but I also, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about JV, about joint venture fishing, because <laughs> it is something that evolved out of the Magnuson Act in 1976 and pushing, um, pushing our, our uh, federal line 200 miles offshore. And it was, it was a uniquely Alaska experience that JV fishery because there were so many other nations fishing off the coast of Alaska, which was also the case off the East Coast, but that joint venture fishing lasted a long time in Alaska. So can you talk a little bit about that experience? Sure, I, you know, I, we had very little joint venture fishing in, in the Bering Sea at the beginning. Actually, my first joint venture experience was uh, with Whiting on the West Coast in the Russians. It was interesting, exciting. It was Wild West. Uh, you know, there was very little attention paid to uh, the things that, that drive our industry today, bycatch, things like that. We didn't know, I mean, we were delivering bags. We didn't know what was in the bags. I mean, we knew there was whiting or we knew there was Pollock, but 
not much else was mentioned. We had observers, hundred percent. We had, uh, you know, we had representatives on the on the the platforms we were delivering to. There were, you know, American representatives. So we kind of knew it was being caught, but there wasn't a bunch of concern about that. And so, but and but you know, on the other side, there wasn't much bycatch. I mean, those are pretty clean fisheries. In today's standard, probably there was today's standards. There probably was bycatch but it certainly didn't raise any red flags and everybody knew it was being caught. So it was all being documented. Um, it, it, was, it was interesting. I mean, the cultural differences, the way to, I mean, we lived together day after day after day. It wasn't like you went home at night. You know, I think the most, I, the mo most days I spent on the ocean without coming to, to town was 110 or 120 days without ever, ever coming to town. We got fuel at sea, we got groceries at sea, we got our mail delivered at sea, and we just didn't come home and we, unless something broke down. And if, you know, if you're lucky enough not to break something major, but even that was, a, you know, if something broke on the boat, the, those ships needed you as much as you needed them. And, uh, and so they would send you know, all the king's horses and all the king's men over to help you fix whatever it did. And they, they would, they would build parts, they would do anything it took to keep you in business and keep you on the water. So uh, very, very few things sent you to town. We did crew changes on the water. You know, we'd send maybe one boat in to just put all the people that are rotating out on one boat and they'd go to town and come back and, it, you know, you'd have a storm for three days and you'd be trying to operate the boat. It was, I mean, the funniest experience there is we got out to, we were northwest of the Pribilofs got back to the grounds and, you know, it was just howling, just miserable weather. You could fish, but it, it wasn't like crew transfer weather. You're not going to put a guy in a boat. And so uh, to go to back to his boat and get your crewman back off the other boat. So <laughs> we had all these guys on the boat and we quickly discovered we didn't have any, <laughs> this is mostly captains and not, there weren't many people wanted to go out on deck and set a trawl. So <laughs> we had to, I mean, it was, it was a, the funniest thing. You had 17 guys on the boat and we could, we couldn't hardly even set a trawl on the boat. So it was kind of funny, but uh, it was good. It was a good experience, built some great relationships. That, another thing about that fishery that some of my dearest friends, um, they, we never, we never knew each other. We never saw each other, but we knew each other better than most people know each other, but we never, we never sat down together. We know no face to face, but we're just being on the radio 24 hours a day, fishing, delivering, you know, it wasn't like you took the nights off. And uh, the first time we got, I got together with Dan Hanson, you know, Dan. And uh, another highlighter. Yeah, yeah, another highlighter. Was we, we, were, we got invited to go to Japan. And in 1984, we'd been fishing together for two and a half years. And uh, we, you know, and I didn't know Dan, he didn't know me before that. And we got to the airport to go to Japan with our wives and stuff. We're going over a two week trip. And he heard me talking, he goes, that's Bob Dooley. Just because of the voice, it was, it was great. And, you know, we're still really close friends. And it, but that, that all, you know, face to face time, not much. You couldn't, you couldn't add up our face to face time probably and, and get a week out of all that but we know a lot about each other and we're good friends yeah that experience is interesting because it sounds so similar to a lot of what we've seen in the last year and over the last you know 10 years a lot of people get to know each other on social media but they don't really know each other in person and then certainly in the last year that isolation on board is what so many large fleets experienced and even small fleets experienced in the year in the summer of you know fishing during covid and and obviously that's continued into the fall and and winter this year so some of the things that you're saying just really remind me of sort of how uniquely prepared your generation was for what's happening right now you know and how history is repeating itself in a in a different pattern Absolutely. I, I, you know, I, I just had a conversation the other day about that. And we were talking about how hard it is to do this and not see each other and be isolated and, and, and being just, you know, linked to Zoom calls and conference calls and such. 
and that being the, the primary way we communicate. And it was, it, we thought about it, we said, you know, fishermen in general are well suited for this. It's what we do. We, we're used to being isolated and just talking on the radio and not, not having the, you know, so uh, we're, I think by and large having a, an easier time than most people have that are on a, that have a real job. <laughs> Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Certainly it is a real job and it's an essential job as we've seen in the last year. Um, so you've, you've mentioned a couple of times, you know, talking about bycatch and how our perspective on that has changed in the deck in the, you know, intervening decades since you started fishing. Um, you've been recognized for your work in advocacy, but specifically in bycatch reduction. You've done a lot of work on this topic including your, you know, being named a National Fisherman Highliner in 2017. Can you talk about what, what stands out to you as significant steps toward bycatch reduction historically, or what are some of those, those um, you know, mile markers that really stand out to you? Well, it, it's funny. I, I, I think a lot of times when you're doing things, you don't realize why you're different, why why you believe things differently than the majority of people do and, and what, what prompted that. And a, particularly the bycatch issue and the accountability issue and observers and electronic monitoring and all the things that are very pertinent today. And you know, uh, why is it valuable to have observe, observed fisheries and, and all of that is what's the benefit? And you know, I've been supportive of that for so long in the, you know, we we had no problem having observers on our boats in Alaska for the you know for Pollock 100% of the time, and and we had no problem with any of that. And and I didn't have problems. Some people do. Some people you know still uh, do, but I I couldn't understand why why am I so different? Why do I drink different Kool Aid? What's what's going on here? And so I I did get it finally, and we started when we started joint venture fishing for you know for pollock and for whiting <clears throat> we had 100 percent observer coverage on the ships that monitored every pound of fish we caught government you know uh, provided those those observers on those foreign ships when we when we tra when the joint ventures went away in alaska particularly when they went away there was no more observers and there was no method for putting observers there was no prescribed method for requiring observers on U.S. catcher boats. So we were, we were confronted by the council and NEMS said, look, um, with the absence of all the data, we had really good data on catch with, uh, with the observers that were on the, on the foreign platforms, but we didn't have that with the, uh, with the, uh, um, when, when the, that went away. So, that's a huge loss of data. We don't, a, a huge loss of certainty of what is out there. So what they said, okay, well, here's the choice. The choice is we need to put buffers in. And I don't remember the exact number, but it was significant. 20, 30% of the allocation was gonna disappear. We're going, wait a minute, that can't happen. What do we need to do? So at the very beginning, we voluntarily took observers on our boats and paid for them, by the way. You know, they weren't, they weren't given, they weren't just put on the boats. And we voluntarily did that because that was the only way we could preserve our allocation. That was really subtle. It wasn't like, um, it was subtle within the Pollock fishery, put it that way. And so later I'm understanding that this is ingrained, never really made the correlation between we get a lot more fish if you know what's being caught, never made that correlation. And that, you know, we started the, we, you know, when we went from the wild, wild west of joint ventures to, you know, uh, over, over capitalization of the fleet with the advent of factory trawlers, particularly in Pollock and, and the West Coast in Whiting. And it, we basically had 200% catching capacity with, you know, the same amount of fish. And so that prompted this inshore offshore battle and all that and the, and the, the, the need to rationalize the fishery, the need to tailor the amount of fishing effort to the amount of fish available to make the operations viable. I mean, we had people bankrupting, going bankrupt left and right, long-term 
participants in that fishery that were disappearing. Uh, it was it was a tough time in Pollock, particularly. Whiting had, uh, had pretty much at that point kind of disappeared for a little bit when we didn't have joint ventures. And now there's a, a huge US presence, but there was a, a little bit of a break in the middle. But Pollock was the focus and particularly Bering Sea Pollock. And so through hard fought battles and ended up being a congressional act, we ended up with, with uh, the um, rationalization in the Pollock fishery, America Fisheries Act. Mm -hmm. And with that came the, the advent of cooperatives and also those that are, that are bestowed quotas have responsibilities and there you know, came a greater need for, for accountability in the fisheries. There came a, a better need for managing bycatch and all that. But this tool of cooperative management was suited for that. And you had a group of fishermen who didn't go from zero to 100 on, on, on accountability, they kind of grew into it. And so um, it allowed us to do a ton of things really proactive um, to eliminate or minimize. You can never really eliminate bycatch. You can minimize it by a lot of behavioral issues and gear innovations. And you know, uh, there's, there's a ton of ways to minimize it. You can never eliminate it. It's uh, you know it's like having a, a bowl of vegetable soup and putting a ladle in there and saying you can't have any A's you know you don't know what's in the ladle until you get it up there but you can you can be informed you know that the twelve o'clock pot on the on the big pot of soup is maybe a cleaner spot than the six o'clock part of the you know that soup looking at it as a clock <laughs> okay so I we we developed those programs and have improved. The downside of cooperative, you know, the, the catch share programs is they're totally, it's not a down, it's an upside, but it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a result of it. They're totally transparent. You can look at the public documents now with co-op reports and see every vessel down to the last fish of any kind of fish they catch. If you look at the, the widening informational reports for the you know, the at sea cooperative sector, you can see how many Ulicon a particular vessel caught in a year. It's all public and it's good because we're, you know, radically aware of, of, of what we catch. We understand it as it's going on. Um, but, you know, uh, but with that comes all your laundry is being hung out to dry and people look at it differently, you know. I mean, some people look at catching 10 salmon as, oh my God, that's terrible. And other people look at it as, wow, you caught, you know, 30 million pounds of fish and you caught 10 salmon. That's pretty good. So it, with it being in that, that format, it, it makes it, it makes it politically, I guess, is a, 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 a tougher job. But I think the results at the end of the day are amazing what, what these cooperative structures can do. And also the limitation they, the, they, do, they do present because after all, you still have to catch fish. You're still, you know, and you're doing it, making the best choices you can in a myriad of choices. You have, you know, a, a typical whiting fisherman leaving the dock today. He's worried about, he can't catch salmon, needs to avoid them at all costs. He has to avoid rockfish bycatch. He has to avoid, uh, you know, uh, every, every there's there's a whole myriad of things that he has to avoid, and and it's you're balancing that. So, from the days when I started joint venturing to now, when I left the dock, joint venturing, all I cared about was catching pollock or catching whiting. Now I don't leave really concentrating on catching pollock or whiting. I concentrate on avoiding most everything and then hopefully catching pollock and whiting enough to at a rate and, and clean enough to avoid too much time in the water, which time in the water equates to bycatch as well, but also balancing all of these other issues. And so you just that that's that's that pretty much. And I but however, the tools available in a cooperative management type of uh, 
fleet behavior is really uh, it, it, it is amazing what can be done. It, 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 it really is. And so I've seen the results of that. I've helped design those programs. I, you know, I was the head of the bycatch uh, uh, committee for, for the whiting fishery at sea whiting, mothership fishery, since it, from inception till 2014 when I quit fishing it and helped develop all of that stuff. And the same in the, in the, in the cooperatives for Pollock in the Bering Sea. I was the president of uh, the West Westward Fishing Cooperative. I was, you know, part of the Inner Cooperative. Um, in that that aspect, worked with tons of fishermen and tons of people to to, you know, achieve the goals we we've, we've gotten to. But once again, it's you know, you're because of the high visibility, you're always a target. Yeah, your progress report is public, which is yes. <laughs> So can we talk about uh, the the management of the trawl fleet? Now there is some, you know, there's controversy about bycatch and that it's not just in the in the Pollock fleet that, you know, that's been ongoing with the King Salmon bycatch, but um, also in cod and other ground fish. Can you talk a little bit about your take on the way that's being managed now and what they're getting for feedback from some of the small boat fishermen? You know, I, I do understand it. I understand the the perspective from both because I I live it here with the Monterey Bay Fisheries Trust and dealing with a lot of small fishermen and and growing up in a, a a small community of you know I mean forever you know it, it you can there's been tension between trawlers and hook and line fishermen and particularly now that we have. Uh, particularly now that we have quotas and stocks that are being shared across sectors, you know, the, the hugest arguments we've ever had that I could, is, has been allocation arguments. Who gets what? How big of a slice of the pie do you get? And that's a, that's a moving target in a lot of cases. Um, you know, fish, fish are dynamic. They move around, uh, the populations, grow and shrink over time. And, you know, everybody's happy when you get a little more on your plate and they're very unhappy when it goes the other way. And I think in some fisheries and, and you know, uh, particularly the, the whiting and the, and the pollock fishery, we're seeing interactions between other fisheries and, uh, and competition for, for a bigger slice of the pie. You see problems in the cod fishery out in the Bering Sea and, and the Gulf that because of the cod, the cod stocks are diminishing. So people want to stay viable, creates tension. And um, the bycatch in the, you know, you're seeing sa the sablefish issue, where catching sablefish. There's, you know, a problem in, in sablefish in that the, we have a couple really big year classes that have entered into the fishery from Alaska to California. There's high bycatch in the Canadian fisheries. There's high bycatch in the uh, of sable in the in the whiting fishery. There's you know on the west coast. There's obviously in the in the Pollock fishery. But overarching that whole thing is this this uh, where these fish live and the splits the traditional splits of quota and in geographically. And so we just went through it on the west coast with. Uh, with sable fish. They were using, I believe, a 10 year average to take the split from Southern, Cal Southern coast, uh, West coast to Northern West coast. It's one, it's one stock, but there's a geographic split at the 36 degree line. And you have sable fish South, sable fish North. That split was kind of hardwired into the, into the calculation based on this 10 year average, I believe was 10. And but now because of this insurgence of, of small fish and new, new year classes, that shift has been um, magnified and, and the, the split wasn't really reflecting the real true biological split, if you want to call it that. It was a, a pretty much a regional agreement. And so the SSC came forward and said, hey, you know, this is a, uh, the, it's changing. And it's changing rap more rapidly than our model 
reflects. So we actually voted on the council to adopt a five-year average now. And what that in effect did is it moved Southern sablefish to the Northern sablefish allocation. Mm -hmm. In this case, it didn't matter because utilization in the South is much, much lower than in the North. In the North, it's right against the, the stops, full utilization. So of course the North is happy, they get more fish. The South, maybe not totally happy, but really doesn't affect them because they're, you know, they have like 20% attainment and they have a lot, a lot of, a lot of extra on their plate. However, if it was the other way and there was a move to, if they were both at hundred percent, that have been really contentious. And I think we're seeing that in other fisheries, that's part of it. I think we're also seeing the effect of diminishing populations in certain runs of like salmon and, and needing a, you know, a place to vent, a, a place to, uh, to place the blame, so to speak. And uh, when you have 100% transparency of everything that's got, it, you could become a pretty good target. Now, I would, I would say, because I was active in developing the SIP program, which is you know, Salmon Savings Incentive Program in, in, uh, uh, <laughs> in Alaska, and the effect of on salmon bycatch, like I said before, you can't eliminate it, but you can certainly mitigate it. And I think it's been mitigated. The problem now is perception is how much, how much is enough mitigation? Where, where is it all, you know, uh, in the context, you know, when you look at, if you focus on the numbers of bycatch as opposed to, uh, as opposed to weighing it against how much fish was how much directed catch was taken. Right. It's hard to get perspective sometimes. So um, all that being said, it's never an easy topic. It's never easy. It's, and everybody has a, a valid point. Um, it go back at a lot of its allocation, but my opinion, and, you know, maybe, like I said, I don't have a dog in the fight anymore. I don't, I don't actively fish. Um, I get to sit and make a lot of decisions at the Pacific Council or vote on decisions in the council um, that put you in places sometimes you're, you're torn because you understand both sides. Um, but by and large, those two sectors, I think are doing a, a really admirable job of avoiding everything to the extent they can. I mean, you know, you have to prioritize something, you have to catch fish, you also have to you know, respect the environment and understand what you're doing. Is it, is the choice, uh, you know, to, to run 500 miles away to go catch a load of Pollock in the Bering Sea and, you know, run 500 miles to avoid everything potentially still doesn't work all the way, but to avoid it while burning, you know, an, another 12,000 gallons of fuel and contributing to the carbon the pollution in our atmosphere. So there's all of those things, all of those, all those pressures. So um, I, I know, I know the one thing that's true, and probably a lot of people wouldn't agree with it, is that I know that the first thing on, a, on, on those guys, particularly the Pollock and the Whiting guys mind because of their cooperative structures, and the, the, the commitments they've made legally and contractually within those cooperatives to avoid bycatch are the first things on their mind when they leave the dock. They're not, this is not Wild West. It's the farthest thing from Wild West. So uh, I guess I've said enough there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bob, that's, that's great. I, I will say, you know, you have been an advocate for a lot of years and this year coming to the end of your first term um, as a member of the Pacific Fishery Management Council um, and you know, you say that you think everyone deserves a voice and that everyone is right to some degree. And I will, I just want to say that is the ideal council member perspective, <laughs> someone who respects all the voices that are coming in from all stakeholders and trying to, trying to strike a balance between those needs and wants. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about your service as a member of the Pacific Fishery Management Council because um, you are reapplying, if I can say that, if that's okay to be public information. Yes. So you are looking to serve again. Um, 
in terms of what you've seen um, in in data gathering in Alaska versus the West Coast, because I think this is something that um, that we need to keep talking about nationally. Um, you know, we certainly are lacking in data on the East Coast in our ground fish fisheries. Um, and it's and it's something, you know, we have highliners like Jimmy Rule, who's been <clears throat> leading in cooperative management and, and we've had a really hard time getting buy-in from the from the management side. Um, so I just want to talk, I want you to talk a little bit about the differences that you've seen in terms of Alaska versus West Coast management and data gathering. Um, you talked a little bit about the sable fish, the five-year average, um, and that that's a significant change. I mean, changing where, you know, what, accepting major changes in, in what the data is showing, you know, that the sable fish are moving around, that the line has shifted. Um, these are things that management has to be able to do more and more because we are seeing changes at a, at a faster rate. And, um, you know, how, you know, how long does it take to, to affect a change like that in a fishery management plan, you know, in the data that you're gathering and have it be reflected in the management of that fishery? And, uh, you know, what's your experience as someone who's been now on both sides and in two different regions? You know, it's a, that's a lot to unpack. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's, okay. that's okay. And I, I you know, I, I'll go back a little bit. Why do, you know, why does 100% uh, accountability mean so much to me in these fisheries and being able to have observer coverage on boats or cameras or whatever to understand what's being taken out of the water. And that whole idea that losing 20 to 30% of your allocation because you didn't have observers was ingrained in me, that there is an intrinsic value of sharing and, and having accurate information of what is taken, what is discarded, and, and that uncertainty that the lack of that oversight contributes cost us money. It cost us money in 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 uh, allocation that is not uh, um, distributed, that's held back because we don't know. So the other part of it is we you know this data is being collected and has been, and COVID now has really shown how important it is. We're we're in the, on the cusp of of seeing new buffers because we haven't been able to run the big white ships. We have not been able to get stock, you know, stock assessments done in a, in a manner that was supported data. And we're not seeing uh, a lot of the co collaborative, cooperative surveys between industry and, and, and the science centers to, to understand what's going on. And, and that's critically important. We're also having problems with observers and, you know, observed vessels by, because of COVID. So this is being magnified. We need to we need to develop and and are in the process of developing ways to man, monitor fleets. There's a tension, a lot of particularly the it seems like the smaller the operations, the more independent. I mean, fishermen are at heart hunter gatherers. We don't like to share information. We don't. I mean, it you know that that I think that that's ingrained in us from the caveman days. We, yeah, only with we, your tribe, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just right. You know so. But that's been there. But we're, the departure of that is these cooperative management sectors. They, they grew the family, grew the pie, and also illuminated what's being caught. There's responsibility in it. Now the, the problem is, is how do we do it effectively and co cost effectively? That's, a, that's the problem. I mean, you know, it was an easy lift to say in, in, in Pollock and in West Coast Whiting to say, look, you have to have 100% observer coverage and you're gonna pay for it. That's an easy lift for the government. Wasn't an easy lift for the fishermen, it's a big cost. And those costs go up. You know, I mean, everyone knows that human uh, labor costs money and it goes up all the time and technology and, you know, tends to go the other way. So the idea of having oversight in fisheries is one, trying to get people to accept it particularly people that don't have it now. Two 
is trying to design a program if we're gonna replace observers with electronic monitoring that, that does the job that people have confidence in, but doesn't cost a fortune, don't over-design it. Um, so that's a, you know, I've been a participant in this electronic monitoring design and, and, uh, and development for years. And we, you know, I've been uh, on the steering committee of the electronic monitoring uh, committees that, that we put on these the, the, um, workshops on the East and West Coast have worked together collaboratively with fishermen all over the country about this. And number one, you have to convince people that it's, that it's something that's needed. And I think it is needed. Two, you need to make it scalable so that the smallest of boats can benefit from it as well as the largest of boats. Right now on the West Coast, we're developing a EM program. It's got tons of flaws. In fact, I'm missing a meeting right now on the uh, GEMPAC, uh, Ground Fish Electronic Monitoring Policy Advisory Committee, and it's a mouthful. And, but the, re the reality here is that my belief is we need this. We need this to understand, particularly with climate change and all that, what's going on in the ocean, what's being taken out to get the maximum uh, benefit on our allocations, to, un to eliminate uncertainty and to illuminate all of our issues, our common issues of bycatch and how, how difficult it is, particularly in changing, you know, changing times and, and how, these, how, how variable it is from year to year. How do we deal with those? And the only way we deal with it, I think in my mind, is through truth and through understanding what's being done and building trust between regulators and fishermen. That fishermen aren't out there, I mean, my, my base belief is if you want to see someone who's concerned about the environment and concerned about fisheries and conserving fisheries and sustainability and all that, that would be a fisherman. They have a vested interest in tomorrow. And, you know, that, that affects them more than anything. So to that, to that end, I think we need to have a system that, that is scalable, efficient, and does the job, not necessarily uh, analyzes every fish down to the fish scale and what's being taken, but serves to verify what fishermen are saying in their logbooks. If they say they discarded 10 fish, the video should back it up and it should be consistent. Can't be perfect because it's an estimate, but it can certainly make it more likely than not, even more almost certain, that's what's being written in logbooks is what's what's happening, and we build that trust. So, um, I that's what I think. That's that's where I think we need to head, and I, I'm I'm an advocate for that. I mean, you'll find a lot of people, particularly independent fishermen, say we don't need that, but as they start digging down, they'll find that they do need it, and it it benefits them. And so that's the that's the analysis that needs to be made. Is is will I be better with this or without this? And I think in my mind, from my experience and from what I've experienced over time, we are better with knowing what's going on and, and, and getting rid of the uncertainty uh, debates and understanding each other, understanding what's going on. I think it brings us together. And you know, that's the, that's the key. Fishermen need to be together on the same page. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay, so in in talking about your <laughs> sorry <Excuse me. laughs> um, <clears throat> about your service uh, as a council member, what has it been like in the last year to be meeting virtually for council meetings? Because you're these are public meetings. Yes, it's been. <clears throat> excuse me. Let me get something to drink here. Yeah. It's been interesting. I'll go back just a bit. You know, when I when I signed up to, I've been active in the council process for years. <clears throat> and when I signed up to do that, to apply to be a council member, I pretty much thought I knew what I was getting into. Hadn't, in, in hindsight, had no idea. It is a, it's a, a big job, particularly for an industry person. State representatives typically have alternates that sit through the meeting, 
change chairs daily, sometimes even during the day, depending on the agenda item. <coughs> Excuse me. It doesn't hurt to have a staff either. <laughs> no, exactly. And so, you know, I'm pretty much by myself, one man show. Uh, and you, it's, it's not just going to a meeting. It is nearly a full-time job. It's, it's a lot. And I guess it's all how you approach it. I mean, I, I've never been one to, you know, go at anything halfway. I, I, either I'm in or I'm out. And I, and I tend to take full responsibility for it. So, <clears throat> excuse me. But I think that we, uh, I think what I've learned, it's a lot easier to throw rocks than it is to catch them. And you catch a lot of rocks when you're a council member. You have to balance a lot of, a lot of issues. You have to make decisions that are, that are contrary to what you really believe sometimes because the overwhelming evidence in, in, in things make you change your mind. So I think I was well suited for doing it because I learned at United Catcher Boats particularly, because if you look at the membership of United Catcher Boats, you have factory trawl representatives, you have uh, fixed gear representatives that, are, that own catcher boats, that own trawl catcher boats. And these entities, you have, you have native corporations, you have all of these people that are really diverse in there. And one of the toughest things we had was that, look, <clears throat> in our meetings, in our board meetings, was check your hat at the door. You're on this board to make a decision for the best interest of catcher boats. And yes, you bring all your, your information that you from your, your life experience and what you do, and that, that you can't ignore that. But when ultimately, when you make a decision, it's not in just in your best interest, it's best interest of everyone. And so <clears throat> I learned that. I learned that, that you have to listen twice as much as you speak. You have to make decisions sometimes that don't agree with your base uh, you know, beliefs. You, can, you need to be open. You need to understand what you're doing. You need to, you need to communicate with a lot of people you need to understand where you're, you know, what people's point of view is that maybe isn't at the table, around the table. And, and that's, who you're, that's who you're representing. You're representing the fish, you're representing the people that aren't there. And so I think that that's, that's what it takes. And I, I, I hope, I, I, that's what I bring to the table, I believe, is that, that uh, it's not neutral. I mean, I don't have a neutral opinion. I'll have a, I have a lot of opinions, but my decisions are based on what's good. Not what's, uh, not what's good for me, what's good for the, the whole. So uh, I've, <clears throat> it's a lot harder than I thought it was, a lot more reading than I thought it was, a lot more interaction with um, sectors that I never interacted with before. You know, I didn't do much high, highly migratory species or coastal pelagic species. And you have to engage, you have to be there and you have to be fair and you have to listen. And so that, that's what I see. Yeah, <clears throat> it's an incredible education. I mean, I obviously have not served on a council, but when I have talked to council members and had them send me pictures of some of the things they have to read that are like, it's like oh, yeah. a dissertation for every meeting. It's incredible. The it, amount it really of information is. you have to process. So taking all that and putting it in, into context of COVID and what it's been like transitioning to COVID and these virtual meetings like we're doing here today, it, it's extremely, there's, there's benefits. I think, I think it's, it's given a public, uh, a greater public forum for public input and public testimony. It's easier to attend a council meeting virtually for, and particularly the small boat interests that don't have a lot of organization around them and, and have issues. That may you know <clears throat> that need to be brought forward, and if you have to, if you you know if you're living in Santa Barbara and you have to fly to Spokane to attend a council meeting for three days, that's a big expense for a small operation, and you really your voice becomes you know minimized. This has helped that. Um, <clears throat> it takes longer to do do things. It's it it uh, you miss the part of the council meetings where. You have public there, you have your advisory panels and management teams, you have <clears throat> a NIMS staff, council staff, of fellow council members that you can interact with because you're, you're 
you're basically sequestered for, you know, for a week at a time. And you, you know, there's a there's a term on the Pacific Council, and I, I I'm sure it's in other councils too, but it's a term. It's called the Council Family. It is. It's a family. Um, <clears throat> I miss all the, all my family. <laughs> I just do, and uh, but and you can do it. We we interact, but you don't get to go, you know, for a bathroom break and talk to somebody in the hallway because you need some information or you know. You don't get lunch with someone. You don't. You don't get that. I mean, everything is more cumbersome, and <clears throat> the amount of material we can cover in a council meeting it is not the same as an in-person meeting. So, it's stressful for everyone involved. It's a lot more work. A lot more hours. Are <clears throat> so what it, the the end result is we're not covering, we're not being able to address all the issues that are on the table. And the agency is having the same exact problems. You know, people are living, they're at home now, you know, before you go to a council meeting and they weren't home, they didn't have to take care of the kids. They didn't have to cook dinner. They didn't have to do all those things. They weren't doing laundry. They weren't, none of that was, you know, on the, on the agenda. So you could focus. Our meetings have stretched out to, you know, I think in the case of North Pacific, they went to three weeks last time in their meeting. And it just, you know, if you take, if you take the advisory panels all the way through the end of the meeting, because they separate them a bit and, and stretch it out and we take weekends off, which, you know, I guess it's a benefit. Maybe it's not, I don't know. It's hard to say. We don't do that when we meet in person. <clears throat> and I, there's a benefit to be able to craft motions sit down at a table with three other council members and craft a motion at, you know, the night before, which you really have a hard time doing on the phone. You don't have that, you, you can't, you, you don't have access, that face-to-face -face is, you can't get, you can't replace that. Yeah. And so um, it's been a, it's been a challenge. And, you know, the agency particularly is, has been a challenge because, uh, they don't have access to a lot of their staff. They, you know, people are working from home. They don't work as they usually do. The, the, the throughput is really diminished, you know, from top to bottom. So we're, we have issues at the council that we're just tabling left and right to, to try to keep up and, and dealing with the important stuff, but realize there's not, there's, there are no, no issues that are unimportant. I mean, if they if, if the council is addressing them, they're not that important. They're important to someone. They might not be the level of importance to the, everyone, but to someone, they're very important and to be delayed years uh, and then not be addressed. You know, functionally, these are all businesses that depend, you know, uh, on on the decisions being made and the, and the, and being able to be implemented. And I think that uh, it's important to get things done. And we're not getting we're not getting everything done we need to, and people are severely worked. I mean, really, you know, our management teams, our advisory panels, they work hard, and do a lot of work, and it's needed to advise to to you know to inform the council how to make a decision and inform the agency. All that analysis is so important, and it's not being done uh, as efficiently. So that there's a cost to what we're doing here with these Zoom meetings, and I can't wait till we get back in person. Yeah, I mean, I think it's easy to argue that even before COVID, council agendas were not full enough to adequately manage all of the issues in each region as it was. Mm -hmm. So to then be slowing it down on top of that is certainly a serious hampering to those businesses and to the industry. Um, I have so, concerns on the bandwidth of the councils as in general. This is a general statement. Um, <clears throat> you know, as every year, at least, and, and more so in the last few years, there's more and more being added to council agendas. Climate change, essential fish habitat, you know, wind energy, aquaculture, all of these things that impact <clears throat> the amount of material the council deals with and the decisions we make. And, and where we have to uh, generate comments and things like that. And there's more and more of that. And budgets for the council, for the agency, 
if you take off the 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 facilities uh, budget, you know the fixed costs that to run these organizations that continue to escalate, you know taxes, everything else, all the way through, they they end up the real budget assigned to doing the work and hiring staff has been flat or negative over many many years, it, even though the, the the overall goes up, and so. We're expected to do a lot more with a lot less, and it, it's it, we're getting to a critical point. Something has to give, and you know, <clears throat> as it is in the Pacific Council, we do five seven day meetings a year, which really in turn, you know, uh, you got to understand all of the that goes into getting those meetings done, all the committee meetings, all of the stuff you do. It's uh, like right now the gym pack meeting that's going on. That's informative to the March council meeting. It's a two day meeting. And, you know, I'm not on the committee, but if you're gonna make a decision on this stuff, you have to sit in on those meetings when you can. And you need to make, you know, inform your decision. You can't just read a report. You need to need to have the backstory. So there's a lot that goes on, a lot. And I, I think most people don't see it. I've become acutely aware since I've been on the council. I enjoy it, it's my life work and love and I, I I enjoy doing you know giving back to the fisheries that that have given to me so much and uh, but <clears throat> it's it's a it's a bigger job than I ever thought it was yeah because you care yeah so, thank you yeah. <laughs> for doing it and taking it on and doing your best to take it on again for another three year shift <laughs> yeah um I, Bob, you know, we could, we have been here for a while and I know you're missing your meeting and I really appreciate you taking this time with us. But before we, I mean, we could, we certainly could talk for another two hours. And before we wrap this up, I just want to give you the opportunity to highlight any other organizations or work that you're doing right now, because I know, um, you know, the council might be taking up a lot of your time, but you're involved in a lot of other groups and advocacy. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about something else. <laughs> yeah, no problem. You know, um, we didn't talk much about Seafood Harvesters of America. And, you know, when we were in the throes of developing catch air programs and going through all of that, I think it was uh, the late, it was before 2010, anyhow. We, I became involved in uh, in a, a thing called National Outreach Days, and it was where fishermen from all over the country co converged on Washington D.C. and went around to their respective offices and and met and talked over you know had conferences and 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 brought their issues forward and it, it was a, a vehicle to get people one to get people to understand the whole process in D.C. as a you know for advocating your your uh, uh, what you need. And, and how that all works. But more importantly, it brought fishermen from all over the country together. You know, I mean, uh, it, from everywhere. And so a group of us, there was probably eight of us, I guess, that got together and said, you know, there's been a lot of national organizations attempted over the years, but, you know, it's time. We need to do it again. We need to try this. And so it took a while to get traction and build the the you know, what it was going to be. And there were several meetings we pulled together. But over and above that, we built this coalition of people, like-minded fishermen that are, that are acutely aware of the need for accountability, transparency to, to benefit our fisheries. And, and more importantly, we built friendships. I mean, I, you know, I knew I knew my local guys. I knew the people I worked with. I had no idea the larger perspective. I mean, I read it in the magazine, but it really was a foreign thing. It was not. It wasn't like we were common. It wasn't like we had common asks. But these national outreach days and a lot of the issues people were bringing forward illuminated that we kind of had a common goal, but we were coming at it from just different shades of gray looking for a bill for this for, you know, for the Gulf of Mexico, looking for something for the Northeast was really similar, looking for something from the West Coast. And much easier if we brought it all together and kind of refined it and said, now we've got a coalition that can go to 
and <clears throat> actually have a voice in their own areas and, a, a, you know, and make it easier for the legislators, make it easier for fishermen to agree on something, get rid of the, the ancillary stuff. Doesn't mean we ignore it, just means we, we try to focus what we're doing. And that, was, that went on pretty much ad hoc for quite a while. And then we, we finally actually started the organization and commissioned it and got executive directors. And we've gone, we're on our third executive director now, but uh, they're, you know, all the people we've worked with before have been so instrumental in, in helping the organization. Difficult, an organization of organizations is difficult because the organizations financially support their own organizations, take dues from their members, and now this is a <clears throat> an organization that needs funding based in DC that advocates for all of us, but where do you come up with the extra money? How do you justify it? Because the typical members of the, the, the member organizations are a step removed from what Harvesters does. We, we seem to be making headway. I think we're doing a, a really good job. I, 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 that core group of fishermen are still there, still believe it with all their heart. And I think that's important. And I think we're making, making great progress. And it's because we don't take, <clears throat> we don't typically take regional issues up. We, we take national issues up that are for the good of everyone. The only way we take regional issues and, and engage in those is if they have the potential of, of affecting nationally. And so we've done a couple of those, but uh, I think this, this organization is, is well overdue and it's a great organization and I'm real proud to be part of it. It's part of the, it was, it's amazing because it's an organization of organizations, right? So part of the, the prerequisite to be a member is you have to have an organization. Well, I was you know, president of United Catcher Boats until 2014 and then I wasn't. And so technically I had to leave um, seafood harvesters, but harvesters didn't want me to leave. So they uh, created associate memberships and I became an associate member and then they um, made it so I could be on the board. So now I'm on the board and then I now I'm the president. So once again, but I, it's a thing I love. I think it's exactly where we need to be headed and it gives, it gives us a, a larger voice and it's a, it's a steady voice. It's not a radical voice. It's a, it's a, a voice that's filtered by common beliefs. And I think that's important. Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, and yeah, you, I mean, a decade in is, is a good place to be. Oh, sorry, yeah. I've, got a, I've got my dog trying to come in the door. Okay. So I'm gonna, um, I just wanna say thank you again, Bob, so much for, for being here with us. And I hope we can continue this conversation again sometime soon and i really appreciate your time and insight i, I feel like we've just scratched the surface of like <laughs> things in bob dooley's head uh, yeah. <laughs> so i just want to say thank you so much it's really great to talk to a highliner and someone with with your breadth of experience and expertise and it just sort of blows me away you know the collective knowledge that that we have available to us and i really appreciate your taking the time today Thanks, Jess. I appreciate it. I'd love to sometime catch up with you on uh, Marine Resource Education Program. I'm totally in the West Coast principal on that and totally believe in that. We have a, there's a, a, you know, trying to, trying to address the graying of the fleet and all of, all of those issues and Young Fishermen's Act. All, all of those things are so important to uh, creating stable fisheries over time and, and knowledgeable people to take the chairs when, when we all decide to get kicked out. <laughs> so anyhow, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I appreciate the time and thank you. And thanks for all you do for fisheries. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. I, you know, you are a highliner through and through and we'll get working on our next agenda. Okay. Okay. Thanks, right. Jeff. Thanks, Bob. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye.